Whenever I need to think, to get inspired, to relax or to recuperate, I go out to nature. Nature does so much for me. I especially like meadows, kind of like this meadow, not far from the Weizmann campus. Next time you're around at the right time of the year, come join me there. But would my children be able to enjoy nature and this meadow in the same way? Or whether you and I would be able to enjoy it in 10 years? The next 10 years are crucial. We have so many environmental challenges in front of us. And I think science is what gives us rational optimism in order to deal with those challenges. That's why I'm so happy to know that the Weizmann decided to embark on the flagship effort that our President Alon Chen told you about. And I want today to take you on a short tour so you'll get to know a bit more about it and to see the many ways in which we're so fortunate here on planet Earth to enjoy natural resources, some of the big challenges, and how science could help us find a path forward. And it's good in those things to start at the very beginning, at the source. And the source for our energy is really coming all from the sun. And we're very fortunate in the fact that on planet Earth, we have from the sun arriving to us in one hour all the energy that humanity uses in a year. And in that respect, we really have abundant available energy. The question now is whether we know how to harness it and whether we make it accessible. So let's take a concrete question. Accessibility to electricity. What fraction of humanity has accessibility to electricity these days? And given that we're in Switzerland, let's take a vote. Is it about 30%, 60%, or 90%? You could think of it like you're now Leo Suchard, the mentalist from two nights ago, and you're trying to read my mind about what's the answer. Or it's actually better, because just reading mind, it's like there's really an answer which is the truth. And it turns out the most optimistic answer is the correct one. Thanks to science and technology, now 90% of humanity has this fantastic capability to be able to achieve electricity. But we're not producing it in a very sustainable or renewable manner. We're mostly achieving it by using fossil fuels that we're burning. And from that, we're getting our electricity, and not only our electricity. It also gives us great things like mobility, which is what enables us to gather here as a big Weizmann family for the Zuri gathering. It also enables us to uh, cool our houses and heat our houses. But at the same time, it's also heating our shared home. So for the past 10,000 years, we've had relatively uh, stable temperatures that now are being affected by these greenhouse gases. It's happening pretty rapidly. Let me share with you how rapidly it is. We could see what data came from NASA collecting all the available information on what's happening in our shared home. So what you see here is a month-by-month -month trajectory from the beginning of documented uh, information of global temperature, and you can see the range at which humanity was, uh, was developing for over 10,000 years. And then you can see the sweeping change, such that the last decade was the hottest on record, and the trajectory is looking to be changing the fastest we see in the whole geological record of the planet. But this is not only a grand challenge in terms of environmental issues, it's also a business opportunity. So the McKinsey Consulting Group has analyzed between now and 2050, what is gonna be the, the sum of money in products that are related to purchases that are associated with greenhouse gas reductions and things that would be bought with new technologies. And they came up with the following number. I know some of the people in the audience are used to big numbers. <laughs> and I also enjoy working with big numbers, although unfortunately not with sums of money. But how big is this number? 
It turns out in the report earlier this year, the McKinsey Group came up with a sum of $300 trillion between now and 2050. That's about $10 trillion per year, more than the net worth of Apple, Google, and Amazon combined. So I think this gives a, a second to pause about really the great opportunity here and why it's so important to have the best possible science and investment in science makes so much sense at this time, given that humanity has this challenge in front of it. And the need to do that type of uh, research was already seen in the vision of the Beck family decades ago when they decided to try and make progress in harvesting the sun's energy using, uh, using science. There's been a lot of progress, both at Weizmann and in other institutions. And based on those findings, we now have, for example, here in Switzerland, new cutting edge ways to harvest the sun. For example, in this building, not far from here in Lausanne, where what you see here are solar panels of new generations. And at the Weizmann Institute, we're working on making those solar panels self-heal, such that they're becoming new materials that could correct themselves with time after all the impinging sun and the electricity that they'll be supplying us. But there's like actually a more advanced and elegant solution or technology for harvesting the sun's energy. It's coming from our friends, the plants. And this is really such an elegant way. Every time I look at them, I just get inspired on what nature came up with as a solution for this problem. It's also what supplies us the food that we're enjoying. And something fantastic has been happening somewhat secretly for the past several decades, but with our ability to be able to take plants and use agriculture. It's summarized in a way in this graph, showing how in the past three decades, there was a sharp decrease in extreme poverty and food insecurity around the globe. What these numbers actually tell you is that in the past 30 years, at least until the beginning of COVID and the war in Ukraine, the headline in the newspaper could have read, yesterday, 100,000 people were lifted from extreme poverty. I wish that was the headline I, when I would open the newspaper or my media outlet. And as I'm saying, this was the value for the past 30 years every year, on average. How did that come about? It's actually a combination or a marriage of at least two scientific breakthroughs. One starts with Fritz Haber, who found a way how to take nitrogen from the air and turn it into fertilizer that gives higher yields. He got the Nobel Prize for that, and actually after being expelled by the Nazis, died here in Switzerland on the way to Palestine to continue there his scientific work. The other is the work of the Green Revolution, what Professor Borlaug got the Nobel Prize for, and that's for finding new breeds of wheat and of corn and of rice, such that you get higher yields for the same parcel of land. But these breakthroughs that gave us that progress are now under pressures. For many environmental reasons, we're now getting the certification in the way we grow our food of different lands, so we're losing land. The aquifers are being depleted of the water, and this trajectory that we had of reaching food security is now in peril. What we need is a new green revolution. You heard a bit from my colleagues, Asafa Aroni and Avi Levy, about their work. And in my lab, we're exploring new ways on how to take CO2 directly from the air, what's known as air capture, use energy that's coming from solar cells, and combine those with bacteria that could transform the combination of those into proteins that could be used into food and feed. That could be done much more efficiently, sparing land and sparing water. 
I know it might sound a bit wild, and it is kind of like a moonshot, or if you like, a solar shot, but I think these are the sort of things we need to explore, and that's our, uh, our emphasis as part of the things that we'll be doing in the new flagship project on how to find new solutions. And we need solutions not only in terms of energy or in terms of food security, there's also something that has to be done in terms of how we're producing green materials. And when we look for inspirations on how to find solutions to that challenge, we go back to the forefather of the field of making things in a green and sustainable manner when faced with a challenge. And the challenge was actually the one faced by Chaim Weizmann during the First World War with the need for acetone that was badly needed for the efforts in Britain. And he came up, given the challenge, with an ingenious solution. He found a bacterium that could turn starch from corn, kind of like popcorn that you're enjoying now, into the acetone that was so needed. What an elegant solution. And that's really the beginning or part of that uh, transition that we now to need to make so much in so many different uh, uh, directions as well. And if you remember, now that we have so many different challenges, you saw many of my friends at Weizmann in the opening video. Each one of them, like Yael Kiro here, is really facing kind of like a new challenge, and they're trying to bring the best possible science in their lab and around campus in order to handle those challenges. What we want to do in the flagship is to take all of that talent and to bring it together and to empower it in order to deal with those challenges of environmental sustainability to find new solutions to those challenges. Not un unlike what Chaim Weizmann did. Because time is so crucial, we want to bring more talent into this and to have many more of the talented students from Israel and from around the globe that are coming to Weizmann to be dealing with those challenges. We found seven foci of excellence, of grand challenges. I told you a bit about alternative energy, about food security, about green materials, and also we'll be focusing on global climate, on marine research, on pollution and health, and finally, on a subject that's very close to my heart, the biodiversity challenge and the environmental crisis associated with it. And for that, I want to show you something that we'll be looking at together. I think it's better than just me speaking. Seeing the beauty of wildlife is easier than ever. Each new BBC nature series is more amazing than the previous one. And we are making progress, and about 15% of Earth's surface is now protected as nature reserves. But the toll on wildlife outside television and nature reserves is huge. For example, in my lab's research, we show that there is 20 times more domesticated mammal biomass than all wild mammal biomass combined. We are in a global ecosystem crisis. At Weizmann, we did the first holistic census of life on Earth in terms of mass. We weighed all bacteria and all animals, all plants and all fungi. We have a clear winner as to what contributes the most. Plants are by far the dominant biomass, comprising about 90% of all living biomass. Plants are therefore the main storage for materials in the living world. They can help us with the challenge of energy and climate change as they store roughly as much carbon as all of our atmosphere and used to store twice as much. Our last speaker today, Professor Tom Crowder, is the world expert on the subject. Plants also give us wood for timber, which is now being used to make skyscrapers in some parts of Asia and hold promise for decreasing the accumulation of anthropomass. Finally, and very importantly, plants give us our food, and for that, 
We need to understand their inner life and secrets, above ground and below. Professor Tamir Klein from the Weizmann Institute is the expert on the secrets of trees. Please join me in thanking nature and in welcoming Professor Tamir Klein to join us.